Good morning, New Brunswick, and welcome to the New Brunswick Today show for this morning, June 2nd, 2017. We've got a very special show for you with a very special guest. We're continuing our series of interviews with the candidates that want to be the next governor of New Jersey. Today we've got a very special guest, Assemblyman John Wisniewski. So do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor. Share this video right now with your friends on your personal Facebook page. I'm doing it right now so that my friends can see this interview and all the great stuff we've got on the show today. Uh, before we get to that, we do have an update on the uh, last last episode. We brought you the story of another election here in New Brunswick. That was actually the uh, New Brunswick school board election that was so close, there was a recount. And uh, where we last left that story, well, we weren't sure if it was going to change the result, and indeed it did. So now the race for school board is tied between Yesenia Medina Hernandez and longtime incumbent Emra Seawood. They both got the same number of votes, 156. That's after the recount found an extra mail-in ballot. So what does that mean? Another election. So June 6th is the upcoming primary election where you're, you're going to get to choose the next governor who represents your party if you're a Democrat or a Republican in that race. But on June 20th, you'll get the chance to decide who fills that one remaining seat on the New Brunswick Board of Education. It's a runoff election. It's something unusual that doesn't often happen, and we've never seen it before here in New Brunswick, but New Brunswick Today was the first to break that story that there is going to be a revote, a runoff election on June 20th here. So keep following NewBrunswickToday.com and the New Brunswick Today Facebook page for updates on that election, as well as the big election Tuesday that's going to have not just the governor at the top of the ticket, but also races for county offices and local offices all around the county. So please keep an eye on New Brunswick today for that coverage. But today we're here to interview one of the people who wants to be your next governor. He is a longtime assemblyman. He's represented Middlesex County in the assembly, so we've got a lot of things to talk about with him. Uh, Mr. John Wisniewski. He's going to be joining us in just a moment, but for now, take a look. This is uh, just to give you a flavor of what the Assemblyman's all about. This is one of his uh, campaign ads. Uh, take a look, and we'll be right back with that exclusive interview after this. What happens on Wall Street happens here in New Jersey. We've seen it time and time again. The policies are pursued for the benefit of the 0.1% at the expense of the middle class. What I see in New Jersey is a middle class that's under siege. A leadership that doesn't care about the working men and women of this state. What happened on that bridge was a consequential thing. It gridlocked that town for days on end, including school buses and first responders. I've lived here my entire life. I'm married to Debbie, and we have three wonderful daughters. My dad was a factory worker. My grandfather was fire chief. One of the things I learned is the value of public service. I'm not a Wall Street executive, I'm a Main Street businessman. I haven't made hundreds of millions of dollars outsourcing New Jersey jobs. I've spent 21 years in the General Assembly. I've taken on the deep entrenched interests that want to run New Jersey for themselves. Published reports suggest they were closed to conduct a traffic study. We Assemblyman John Wisniewski is leading the investigation. The As I dug deeper into it, I found out that there was something suspicious about what had happened in Fort Lee. I sat here in this house reading through these emails until I came to an email that said, time for traffic problems in Fort Lee. Boom. I was absolutely stunned. Those eight words are sending shockwaves toward New Jersey Governor Chris Christie tonight. That amounts to using public property for a private purpose or for a political purpose, and that's not legal. I support Bernie Sanders because he sees a rigged economy and criticizes it when others are silent. At the beginning of the investigation, there were Democrats who also urged me not to take on that investigation, who warned me that it would be an embarrassment. He believes that men and women have a right to go to work every day and earn a living wage and provide for their family with dignity by a minimum wage of not less than $15 an hour. Breaking news, guilty on all counts. I believe New Jersey deserves the kind of leadership that's not transactional, but is transformative, to make sure that the middle class has a fair shot. Nothing's impossible with the right kind of leadership. My name is John Wisniewski, and I'm running for governor of New Jersey.
and welcome back to the New Brunswick Today Show. I'm Charlie Craddeville, and we are here at the Hidden Grounds Coffee Shop on Easton Avenue in New Brunswick. Thanks for joining us, and thanks so much to Assemblyman John Wisniewski. Charlie, thank, thank you. you. Appreciate having you on the show. Uh, you are Middlesex County, born and bred. Yeah. Uh, raised yes. in Sayreville, still live in Sayreville. Still live in Sayreville, went to college up here on College Avenue. Indeed, a Rutgers alum as well, and uh, what I want to know is, how'd you get into politics? Your first election was 1995, right? Well, actually, I ran first in 1991. I ran for borough council in Serval. Uh, it was not a good year for Democrats. It was in the midst of the backlash against Governor Jim Florio. And so Democrats statewide lost very many seats in the legislature as well as local seats. I ran in 93 for the first time for the assembly. I came within 400 votes, wow. but I didn't make it. Tried again in 95, and I won that one. And I've been in office ever since. Awesome. So you didn't give up when you lost those first two elections. Tell me, though, what motivated you to want to get into politics in the first place? It's, I grew most up people don't want to run for office. Well, that's unfortunate be yeah. because we, we see far too many good people who would have an enormous contribution to our party, to our process, walk away from it because they're turned off by politics. I grew up in a political family. My dad was a Democratic chair in Cerebral, later became a councilman for 12 years. I got involved in campaigns, delivering literature. Uh, later, when I was in high school and college, I ran some of his campaigns. And uh, I grew up in a family of public service. My grandfather was a fire chief. My dad was a fireman as well. And then, at some point, you decided to go to law school. And you actually went to uh, one of the top schools, Seton Hall. I went to Seton Hall. Seton Hall Law School in Newark, yeah. And you were actually a classmate of the current governor, is that correct? I was, Chris Christie and I were in the same graduating class at Seton Hall Law School in 1987. Okay, and so we just saw from that commercial, one of your big claims to fame is you helped uh, investigate the whole Bridgegate saga. Uh, what was it like? Uh, you know, do, do you and Chris Christie have a relationship still, or...? or uh, <laughs> we never had much of a relationship other than both having gone to the same law school and you know, being aware of each other in, uh, as classmates. Uh, we, we weren't on each other's Christmas card lists, and uh, we didn't have each other over for coffee. But uh, Bridgegate was an interesting episode because when it started out, it really was not clear what had happened. It seemed something wrong had happened, and as we dug into it, we found, I found, the email that said time for traffic problems. And, you know, up until that point in time, there was no indication that the governor had any involvement. And then with that email, suddenly you see one of his deputy chief of staffs orchestrating the bridge caper. And, you know, it shows that this is an administration that doesn't really care about the rules. Uh, sure. When you look at Bridgegate, you see uh, an administration that uh, had its own rules and didn't care what other people thought. And, and you go forward to, to this day, Governor's trying to spend upwards of almost a billion dollars to renovate the state house, not going for voter approval, bypassing the legislature. He doesn't think the rules apply to him. And now it was interesting how you even ended up being able to get that email in the first place, right? Because your your, your committee subpoenas. was one of the few that had subpoena power, and you obtain that subpoena power through a uh, you do a vote of the full assembly. I mean, so right. when it started, it was just a transportation committee, and we were investigating about the, the toll, toll heights, increases. Right? Yeah. And uh, you know, candidly, I was glad to get the subpoena power, but it wasn't easy to get, and we had to renew it because the port authority was dragging their feet. Uh, and so we got it renewed. And in the midst of that, uh, we found that this lane closure had happened, and we got the subpoenas out. We we took testimony from the executive director of the Port Authority and others, and it became clear that there was there was no traffic study. It was all a cover-up. And that Bridget Kelly and Bill Baroni and David Wildstein and I still believe the governor orchestrated this because it was politics. Yeah, and you used your lawyering skills kind of to, to lead that committee and interview a lot of witnesses asking tough questions, exposing things, and bringing that out. So I just want to thank you for that. They, they, the, those skills came in handy. You know? in, indeed they did. Um, but I have, uh, I, I want to ask, yeah. why, why didn't you guys finish the job and push for impeachment? Well, we, we had one hand tied behind our back. Yeah. When Mr. Fishman, the then U.S. attorney, issued his indictment, we were in the middle of our investigation. Uh, my concern and others was that if we were continuing that investigation, the defendants would ultimately be able to point at the legislative committee and say, 
they interfered with our ability to have a fair trial, uh, to actually have an impartial trial. So we decided to put that on hold. Now the plan was always to go back and continue the job, but uh, the legislative subpoena power expired with the end of the session. It would have taken another vote. And, and legislative leadership was never really in love with the idea of investigating Chris Christie. Oh, yeah, uh, you don't felt, know where it's going to lead. Well, and then, you know, obviously the transactional nature of politics was that legislative leaders were unhappy with it because while we were investigating the governor, the governor was not going to sign any bills, was not going to make appointments. And so they just wanted to get what they wanted to get done. They didn't really care about getting to the truth. And uh, it's unfortunate because when you have the governor do something like this, it erodes confidence in government. And going back to the thing you first said, you know, why don't we have more good people running? Well, when people see government power being abused, they, they say, well, you know, I'm not sure I want to be involved in that. Understood. Um, just though, as a matter of policy, do you think that the governor should be impeached? I mean, a lot of stuff came out in that trial, the well, federal I we, trial. I think we ought to continue the investigation. Uh, you know, for instance, we weren't ever, ever, ever able to actually examine the governor's cell phone. We weren't right. able to actually get the, the, the data about his text messages. I would wanted to issue subpoenas. I got pushback from legislative leadership who had to sign off on those subpoenas, and so we never got it done. Uh, I think that under a new governor, I think under a new legislative uh, leadership, we could get that done. Okay. And so, uh, just if, the, if there was a vote today on impeachment, you, you're... Oh, I would, yeah. I mean, vote to look, I, I think that... Uh, We've got a lot of impeachment talk going on because yes. uh, I think that uh, the more critical issue facing not only New Jersey but the country is the craziness going on in Washington, D.C., where you know, you've got the President of the United States engaged in uh, conduct that uh, you know, clearly is questionable and maybe even illegal. I think that uh, we have to start there. Yeah, yeah, certainly. So, you uh, fair to say you support the impeachment of President Trump, or I think it's something we ought to start looking at. Okay. Um, now, I, I want to know what separates you from your opponents. There's a lot of big issues in this election. You know, the environment, transportation, uh, how how to fund all of this stuff, the pension crisis. Uh, what do you think separates you from the other five Democrats that are seeking the nomination? You, you know. I'm a Main Street businessman, Sarah. I run my own law practice, uh, but I'm also a 21-year legislator. I've had an opportunity to not only observe and, and act in state government, but understand what works and doesn't work. Uh, we have to recognize that governor is not an entry-level position. The idea that somebody will come in inexperienced, untested, and can actually handle the complexity of New Jersey state government is laughable. We've seen this before. Uh, John Corzine came in. Uh, a well-intentioned man who had absolutely no idea on how the state worked. And uh, because of him, because of John Corzine, we wound up with Chris Christie. We can't allow that to happen again. So if you wanted to put it in a word, it's experience, it's testing. Uh, during the 21 years I've been in the legislature, I have not been uh, anybody's uh, agent other than those of the people of New Jersey. So when it came time to stand up to John Corzine, when he wanted to sell the parkway and the turnpike, I stood up, said, no, stop that. We saved jobs and prevented an 800 percent toll increase. When it came time when Democratic leaders wanted to join with Governor Christie and punish public employees, I stood up and I said no because it was wrong to do that. And on Bridgegate, when there were a lot of people who were saying, you know, don't, don't do this, for a variety of reasons, whether it was embarrassing because it was a traffic jam or because he was a powerful guy that some people said could be president. Uh, I went ahead and pursued it because it was the right thing to do. And I think that's what the people of New Jersey are looking for, is somebody that not only believes in the progressive values that they want to see New Jersey embrace, but somebody who has a track record of actually standing up to the special interests and listening to what the people want. Now, for a long time, you've uh, chaired the Transportation Committee in the yeah. Assembly. That's kind of how you ended up in the whole Bridgegate saga. Um, a lot of people are not happy with the current state of affairs, they both with the, the roads and the, the train system here. Tell me, if you're elected, what will you do to uh, get NJ Transit and the, you know, the, the highways back to... So, no, I, I chair the order. Transportation Committee, which means I have the ability to provide a level of oversight, but I don't have the ability to run New Jersey Transit or run the Department of Transportation. So, we can be the squeaky wheel, but when the governor doesn't want to put the oil on the squeaky wheel, nothing gets done. So for years I've been advocating for better management of New Jersey Transit. When we could park rail cars 
right by the Passaic River in the middle of Hurricane Sandy and lose hundreds of millions of dollars of assets, you know that you don't have good management at New Jersey Transit. And when you continually shortchange the agency of the money that it needs to actually run, you, you can't run the nation's third largest transit agency without money and management. And, and that's one of the things that I would change immediately. I'd make sure that we had a nationwide search for a world-class transportation leader who would not only be able to manage the resources, but actually make the trains and buses run on time. Okay. Um, you stood out among uh, Democrats in New Jersey by being uh, really the only elected official in that party to support Senator Bernie Sanders in his campaign for president. Everybody else lined up behind Hillary Clinton. Uh, tell me, why did you make that choice, and uh, are, you know, are you happy that you did? Well, first, let's let's make, be clear. I was the only legislator to do it. There were other uh, council Lo members, local local, yeah, official local officials. Yes. So I don't want to take the title of being the only. Sure. Uh, but look, I so I chose to support Senator Sanders because I I believe in his philosophy. I support many of the ideas that he embraces. I recognize that we were going to have a tough battle. You know, I did not subscribe to the view that some Democratic leaders had then and have now that uh, we've got this, it's done, we don't need to worry about it. Uh, and going into that election, uh, there, was a, there was an arrogance about how the election was going to turn out. I recognize that Senator Sanders brought passion to the election, brought so many excited, enthused voters. And remember, the way Barack Obama first got elected was by being exciting and bringing people into the process that weren't into it before, bringing new voters in, getting people engaged. And Senator Sanders had that ability, and we saw that in the primary. And unfortunately, he wasn't our standard bearer in November, because I believe had he been, uh, we would have had a different result in Washington, D.C. And so perhaps the biggest issue for Senator Sanders was uh, campaign finance reform, money in politics. Well, a lot of big issues, money in politics, single payer health care, sure. uh, minimum wage. Tell me, where do you fall on that issue, the campaign finance issue? Oh, we have too much money in politics. Look, it's ridiculous that we have one candidate in this race who has spent more money, over $18 million, than the other nine candidates combined. Four times the amount of money that the other nine candidates combined have spent and raised. I mean, it's, it's an obscene amount of money that says nothing else than uh, the only the only qualification that that person has for office is that they have a lot of money and they could use it. Uh, but what we're seeing in, in the polling, it's not my opinion, uh, people have been polled in the state relentlessly for almost a year. 50% uh, of the electorate are still undecided. After a barrage of $18 million, I mean, he may be trying to buy the election, but the people aren't buying him. Fair enough. Uh, that said, though, you have, uh, you know, had to raise money to get elected yourself over and over again. And uh, uh, in 2012, uh, you and Bob Smith were accused of having a network of political action committees that uh, uh, you know. Look, uh, the, the reporter, uh, the reporter who did that, Matt Friedman, mm -hmm. uh, you know, likes to omit facts and not really tell the whole story. And so he's a great guy for doing guilt by association. But the fact of the matter is, the story was wrong. What was wrong about it? Tell, tell me. He was trying to blame me because people I knew were engaged in fundraising. I mean, you know, we're a small universe of people, uh, both here in Middlesex County and statewide, who engage in fundraising. The odds of one of us knowing somebody else is pretty high. Sure. And so to automatically cast the aspersion that somehow, because you know them, because they used to work for you, somehow makes you responsible for their actions down the road is absolutely absurd. Okay, so just for the record, you were not involved in those organizations at all, the, the, the PACs? Okay. Um, and I, I do want to ask about uh, your, your, your day job. You, you've been a lawyer for a long time. You have your own firm. Yeah, I mean, um, the legislature is a part-time job. So most of us, uh, I'd probably say something in the order of 80% of New Jersey legislators have some other occupation. And many are lawyers. Uh, well, I mean, you'd be surprised. We've got doctors, we've got chiropractors, we've got dentists, we've got teachers, college professors. I mean, it's, 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 it's not exclusively a lawyer occupation. Sure, sure. I understood. Um, but now, like, for instance, your firm uh, doesn't have to make political donations, but they do. So you've uh, just looked up, it seems like, at least $13,000 since 2009. You've donated to various candidates. Yeah, but let's put that in context, right? You know, you sure. people hear $13,000, they go, oh, that's a lot of money. Since 2009, it's 2017, right? So in eight years, 
$13,000, which is about $2,000 a year. I understand. It doesn't yeah. compare to the money that your, yeah. your so, chief I mean, opponent is throwing think, around. But, but I think but, you've got to put it in context because, you know, a person listening to this and they hear that number, that, that number aggregate, you know, takes somebody's salary over the same period of time. You say, wow, they're making a lot of money. You break it down on an annual basis, it's not so big. And so, yeah, $13,000 is a lot of money, except when you break it down on an annual basis and it comes out to two or $2,500 a year, it's not a great amount of money. Well, I, I understand that, but doesn't your firm get government work? Yeah, we have, we have contracts that we get from uh, municipalities, but you know what, we compete for that. You know, the, 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 the implication that somehow you write a check and you get the work, all the, all the work that we've got, we've had to compete for it. And, so, we've, and we've lost some of those competitions, and so it's not, you know, there's not a one-for-one -one relationship. And the fact of the matter is, is a lot of the people that I've supported are people I've supported long before I got any government contracts. Okay, and so you would do... About 80% of the work I do is not government-related. Most of the work my law firm does actually is with private clients. Right, so you would reject the assertion that it's pay-to-play, where you're, you're giving donations and getting work. It's not, it's 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 not, not a direct... True. I mean, look, you know, it's a, it's a sexy charge. It makes for interesting copy and it makes for an interesting TV show. But the reality is that that's just not how it works. And, you know, when you say that somebody who's given $13,000 over that period of time, $2,000 a year, is somehow getting contracts, and, and, and then you're, you're in, in the same context, we're talking about a guy who's spent $18 million over the course of two years to buy an election. It's apples and oranges. Okay, fair enough. Uh, I, uh, I want to ask about uh, you know Middlesex County politics. For, mm. for a long time, it was dominated by uh, the, the former mayor of New Brunswick, John Lynch. Tell me about your relationship with uh, Senator Lynch and you know uh, what role he still plays in Middlesex County. Doesn't, doesn't, I don't have much of a relationship with John Lynch. Uh, didn't have one then, don't have one now. Uh, I haven't seen him around. People tell me he's still involved in some capacity. I'm not really sure about that. Okay. Um, and uh, so your law firm, you said 80% of the work you do is other, other clients? Private clients. Um, what type of work do you do for them? We do uh, land use development, we do wills, we do municipal court, we do um, matrimonial, we do some minor criminal work. It's a general practice law firm. So general we, practice, we get, okay. Uh, we get a variety of things in, business purchases, business sales, real estate closings. Okay, and I want to ask you about a story that was uh, uh, identified your firm as representing U.S. Metals, a company uh, uh, Got in trouble for contaminating whoa, 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 place whoa, in Carteret, right? Based on what? My, my, I was involved in a representation that provided the borough of Carter a million dollar settlement. Yes. So that they could clean up the community and has a program of remediating residential properties. And so again, you know, the representation of the factual basis of the question is inaccurate. So my involvement was to help us broker a settlement that got the Borough of Carteret a payment of a million dollars and has, in the process, a remediation of residential properties across the community. It's a good thing. Okay, but you, I mean, your client was U.S. Metals, correct? Right, but, okay. but, but, but that was the representation. Yeah, but, the, but the question was, your, your question was, client who got into trouble. That was the question. Okay? The, the, I think the, that's not the fair to say that. It's, it's not accurate. Okay. It's not accurate. Okay. Okay. They, if you're asking questions, it's really important that the questions be accurate. I agree. I agree. And yeah. so, so you don't think it's fair to say they got in trouble, but they they did come to a settlement. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, let's let's be clear about it. It's a it's a ongoing process uh, for a factory that stopped operating in 1980. Okay. So 37 years ago, uh, about 80 percent of the the property that had been the site of that factory has been remediated. It's an ongoing process. As warehouses have built on it, capped, remediated. And so, you know, you, you, you take it out of context, you use the words, got into trouble, and you create an entirely different story uh, based on that misrepresentation of the facts. Okay, well, I apologize if I got the yeah. facts wrong. I just wanted to ask you to respond to the story. Um, but but uh, just changing gears, another environmental issue in your area, uh, planned pipeline, Transco, 
pipeline would go through there's Old Bridge, a, there's a whole bunch South of Ambulance. pipelines that are going through the state of New Jersey. There's the Penn East, there's the Pilgrim, yes, yes. there's the gas pipeline down in the Pinelands, there's the Transco pipeline that uh, is actually, as I understand it, is actually being built. Uh, the Transco pipeline has uh, acquired rights of way. Uh, I believe they're looking to run a pipe across the, the Raritan Bay. Yes. Uh, and that, 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 unfortunately, that, that project has already received its permits and is underway. And, and it's not clear that the business case was ever there for it, but that's one that I don't know how you, you pull it back because it's partially being built as we speak. But there are so many places where we have an opportunity to actually stop it, Pilgrim. Penn East, uh, even the Pinelands. So you're opposed to all of these, yes, all of these yes. plants. Well, let's take a look at the Pinelands. Uh, the Pinelands one, the governor manipulated the Pinelands Commission. Yes. Uh, got an approval. It's being litigated as we speak. Uh, in order for that pipeline to be built, the Department of Environmental Protection has to still issue a permit. Uh, so while that litigation is pending, I don't, I don't believe that will be resolved before the next governor takes office. So the next governor literally will have the ability to stop that dead in its tracks, as well as Pilgrim, as well as Penn East. I'm committed to doing that should I be given the opportunity to. Okay. Um, been in the legislature for more than two decades now. 21 years. Tell people, what are some of your biggest accomplishments? What do you think, you know, bills you got passed or God. things that you stood up for? You know, 21 years uh, gives you a lot of opportunity in a lot of different capacities. And so early on in my tenure, uh, I had uh, participated and was one of the co-sponsors of the legislation that deregulated energy rates in New Jersey to give people choice. You, know, you can now actually go and buy your electricity from renewable resources if you choose to. Uh, you didn't have that before that. And that gives uh, people in New Jersey who really want to put their money where their mouth is and support the environment and uh, try to avoid using uh, fossil fuels for their electricity to actually buy their power from green energy sources. Uh, early in my tenure also, we had a tragic fire at Seton Hall University. Yes. Uh, dormitory caught on fire and uh, no one had probably fully considered it, but our dormitories weren't sprinkled. Yeah. And so there was no fire suppression sprinkler systems in any of our college dormitories. I worked with the late Assemblyman John Kelly, and we passed the Fire Sprinkler Act for school college dormitories, and we now have all of our college dormitories have fire suppression sprinklers. I was very proud of that because that provides an opportunity to save lives and, and protect our youngest in the uh, college years. More recently, I was responsible for the legislation that created our graduated driver's license program. Too many young drivers lose their lives, uh, largely because of inexperience and distractions. And so we uh, regulated the hours of operation because we saw the most fatal, serious crashes were happening in the overnight hours. We were seeing the crashes were happening when the cars were new drivers with lots of kids in the cars. And so we've had an impact in making our roads safer. Uh, but I've also been very proud of the work that I've done in transportation and trying to uh, make New Jersey's transportation system run better. Uh, until we got to Governor Christie, I'd like to think we we're making progress in the right direction. This governor's taken us backwards, starting with his cancellation of the ARC Tunnel, as well as his underfunding of New Jersey Transit and his continuation to take money out of transportation and use it to balance the budget. Corrupting the Port Authority. Too. Well, yeah. you know, the Port Authority was a and has been an agency uh, able to be corrupted because of the way it's constituted. Yeah. You know, when the when the Port Authority Compact was created you know, almost a century ago, uh, it was a different time and place in government. Uh, but now we see this agency is really uh, devolved into warring camps: uh, the New York uh, side of the Port Authority and the New Jersey side of the Port Authority, and to get anything done in either state, you have to spend an equal or greater amount of money in the other state. Ken Lipper, one of the outgoing commissioners on the Port Authority, said that he objected to that philosophy, which essentially he called, I'll let you waste a billion dollars yeah. if I can waste a billion dollars. That's people's money. That, you know, when you pay $15 to go across the bridge or through a tunnel, I mean, that money is going to these projects, some of which are not warranted, some of which are just done for political gamesmanship. That's got to change, and as governor, I'm committed to changing that. Okay. And, uh, you know, while we're on the topic, what do you think about what happened to David Sampson? He, uh, huh. he got a slap on the wrist. pretty sweet deal, right? Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's, it's going back again to one of your original questions. It's one of those things that erode public confidence and make people wonder whether they should even be involved. Uh, this man 
extorted from one of the largest airlines in the world a private flight for him to go to a palatial estate down in South Carolina. It wasn't that he couldn't afford it, not that that would be a justification, uh, but it was arrogance. It was excess. Uh, and when somebody in that position of power, a former attorney general, who should know, should know better, better. who yeah. should know better, uh, uses his authority and gets other people. I mean, don't forget, he was not the only person. There were others implicated. Uh, one of them passed away. But the fact of the matter is, is that there were other people enabling this to happen. Uh, shows that the system is easily corruptible. And we have to change the system. And, and the reason that's important is that people who have, you know, a, a good reputation and a good heart and, a, and, and want to do the right thing are very concerned about getting involved in government where they think uh, they're going to be associating with people who have bad intent. They don't want to be, they don't want to have their, their name or their reputations attached to that. And so what happened to David Sampson just lowers the esteem and it lowers the confidence in the public system. House arrest in your palatial estate in South Carolina for a year? I mean, there are people that are looking for that opportunity to spend a year in a estate in horse country in South Carolina. That's not a Wouldn't punishment. Wouldn't be so bad. Yeah. yeah, that's not a punishment. Well, conversely, what do you think about what happened to Bill Baroni and uh, Bridget Kelly? You actually uh, questioned they Baroni, and that law. was a key piece of evidence Look, in, the, in, the, in the case. Do Bill Baroni came before the Transportation Committee and he lied, flat out lied. And he should have known better, too, as a lawyer, as, as, as a, a lawyer, legislator. As a former legislator, as somebody given the public trust, he knew what he was doing, and he was trying to, you, you had to be in the room when he confronted, and I have to use that word deliberately, he confronted the Transportation Committee uh, to challenge us as to why we were challenging him. And it was, you know, the best defense is a good offense kind of uh, theory for him. And it was a lot. And yeah. so, you know, what they got is what they deserved. Uh, I feel very bad. Uh, nobody should have to uh, go to jail for being involved in government service. But when you violate the public trust, there has to be some consequence. Otherwise, it really is an invitation for other people to violate that trust as well. Um, so. You're Middlesex County, County guy, you know New Brunswick well, it's the county seat. Um, we've had Democrats in power, uh, your party, for a long time. Uh, since I can remember, we've actually had the same mayor since 1991. Uh, you've probably met him and worked with him on things. What do you think about how the mayor here has done and what changes you've seen in New Brunswick during your time as a legislator? Well, uh, let me compare it to, you know, I went to college here, graduated right. in 1984. The building we're sitting in didn't exist. The building across the street didn't exist. Uh, Greasy Tony's was at the corner. Uh, the grease trucks were across from Scott Hall. And so uh, downtown New Brunswick has had a phenomenal renaissance in the uh, 20, 30 years since I've gone to college here. And, and that's a, a testament to the leadership that we've seen on a local level in New Brunswick, to the state leadership that's partnered with so many corporations, J&J, &J, Rutgers University, to help bring a renaissance to New Brunswick. Because we do better all the time. Uh, we have to make sure that when we're revitalizing a community like New Brunswick, uh, that there are people who have called New Brunswick a home for a long time, 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, we don't want gentrification to push out the original inhabitants of New Brunswick. They deserve to live in this enhanced community as much as newcomers. And so one of the dangers, one of the challenges really for any any administration, any governmental agency trying to redevelop re and revitalize their community is to make sure they're not pushing out the very people who live in the community. And that's always that's always a tension. I hear about that here in New Brunswick, and I hear it about it in other communities that are undergoing revitalization. Great. Uh, I know you got to run. Just two quick questions yes. for you. I, uh, uh, you know, the Middlesex County Democrat Party uh, decided to support one of your opponents, the same one that everybody else supported. Um, Tell me about that process, because I want people well, to understand. There was no process, right? I, I mean, want people look, to understand that why you know why uh, I, all, I, these, all these counties ended up endorsing one candidate, and you, we'll you felt Middlesex like it wasn't County. a fair shake, right? It wasn't. It wasn't. It was pay to play. It was. Look, Kevin McCabe uh, sold the Middlesex County party line to Phil Murphy. Uh, he told me that. Uh, he told me it was about money. And uh, that's the end of the day what this whole election has been about for party leaders. So Phil Murphy made a big donation to the county party and they said, okay, you can be our choice for, basically, for government. Basically. And, you know, 
that really, again, undermines the credibility of government when people understand that it's all about money, it's all about insider deals. Uh, you know, that's what turns people off. And, and when you look at a turnout in last year's presidential election of 53% of the vote, when you look at what's projected to be a turnout in a primary election of 20% of the vote, maybe 15, uh, we have to do something better than we're doing now. And yes, same day registration, early voting, you know, all of those things are important. But we have to have a better process, a fairer process. When people think that the process has already been rigged before they show up at the voting booth, uh, people don't want to participate. When people think that their vote's not going to make any difference because the candidates are controlled by corrupt party bosses, they don't want to participate. We have to change that. Well, thanks for giving us your side of the story. We, we reached out to Kevin McCabe, and he didn't really have much to say. Um, the last question I want to ask, we do have a wide audience here in New Brunswick that, that watches this show. Tell the, tell the people of New Brunswick and the greater New Brunswick area, what will you do for them? Uh, you know the area well. What, uh, as governor, what are you going to do for New Brunswick and Middlesex County? Well, what New Brunswick and Middlesex County needs is a leader, first of all, who understands central New Jersey. Uh, born and raised in Serval, educated here in New Brunswick at Rutgers University. Uh, there's no better advocate for the center part of the state than somebody who understands the daily travails of trying to navigate the traffic of central New Jersey, understanding the challenges and getting on a train, whether it's here in New Brunswick at Metro Park or at South Amboy. Uh, I have 21 years of experience in the legislature. I understand state government. I understand what works and what hasn't worked. And we need to have an experienced governor, not somebody looking for on-the-job training. But I'm also a small businessman. I run a business on Main Street in Cerebral. I every single day deal not only with the constituents I represent, but the ordinary men and women of this county who are looking for help from a lawyer or looking for help from a legislator. It's that kind of experience on the ground that matters most in government. I bring that experience and I'd ask for your support so that I can be New Jersey's next governor. Well, thank you so much, Assemblyman. Really appreciate your time. Good My luck pleasure. with the campaign. Thank you. Everybody, make sure you go out and vote. No matter what party you're in, get out there and vote. Tuesday, June 6th, there's a lot of choices on the ballot. and. Mr. John Wisniewski is somebody who is willing to come here to New Brunswick today and speak to you. Uh, so please consider him and all the other candidates. And don't forget, we've got another election coming up June 20th after that. Uh, please stop by and support Hidden Grounds. Get a cup of the best coffee in New Excellent Brunswick. Excellent coffee. <laughs> and uh, thanks so much, everybody, for watching. We'll see you next Take week. Take care.